Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our first event of the spring 2016 semester. A big thank you to all of you for tuning in tonight. I, I know the beginning of the semester can be a busy, busy time. Um, this presentation will be recorded and available on our website shortly. I just added the link into the discussion area if you want to access that. Many of you will know Dr. Pat Franks as an SJSU iSchool professor and, Mar and MARA program coordinator. Dr. Franks is also an active academic and prevalent voice in the archives and records and information management profession. She authored the book Records and Information Management, published in 2013, and was team lead for ANSI ARMA Standard, Implications of Web-Based Collaborative Technologies and Records Management, and the Technical Report, Using Social Media in Organizations. She is co-editor of the Encyclopedia of Archival Science, published in 2015. Also, as a member of the InterPairs Trust research team, she leads two projects, Social Media and Trust in Government, and retention and disposition in a cloud environment. Again, thank you all for attending, and a big thank you to our presenter. Uh, feel free to take it away, Pat. Thank you very much. And uh, my first slide gives you an idea of what some people might think of when they hear the word archivist, <laughs> uh, especially uh, me, because I like some of these far out things. So the first one over on the right is from Dungeons and Dragons. Any of you recognize that? Another one is just a terrific image that I found. Uh, and then another one is from a WoW Wiki. Uh, but the two that actually have real jobs that get paid to be an archivist are on the left. Uh, the first one is a digital archivist. She actually is a data services coordinator at the Digital Public Library of America. Uh, and then a more traditional role down below, anybody recognize? I'm, I'm seeing a note someone can't hear anything. So can the rest of you tell me if you can hear me? Yes? Okay. So I will keep going and perhaps someone can help that person. Now, did anybody recognize the image down below on the left? Well, if you're going to be an archivist, you better. That's uh, David Fario. He's our Archivist of the United States, and he actually uh, was a librarian, right? New York Public Libraries. And that is the Declaration of Independence. Uh, he is uh, at NARA, the National Archives, and that's where you could see that uh, on display. So what is an archivist anyway? Uh, I'm going to quote two people throughout this presentation that have um, written entries for the Encyclopedia of Archival Science that was mentioned. Uh, the first one is Reto Shan. And uh, Reto is an archivist uh, in West of Vancouver uh, archives. And, uh, Rento says that an archivist is an individual who keeps records of enduring value so that they may function as reliable evidence of past actions. And actually, uh, archivists describe their job that way, so do records managers. So you're going to hear me talk a lot about this convergence of the fields and the fact that if you create a record, you usually keep it because it's evidence of something like the Christmas receipts that you had that you know you'd have to hang on to if you're going to return anything. Uh, so to keep records requires that the archivist will perform some kind of archival tasks, right? They're going to uh, acquire the correct records. They're going to appraise them to see if they're worthy uh, of all of that effort that it takes to maintain them. And then arrange them and describe them so that others can locate them and use them. And then, of course, we have the issue of preservation. How long do we have to keep them and how the heck are we going to do that? Now, not all definitions, though, when we talk about archivists or archives are the same. And many organizations have international branches, especially when you're talking about Corporate archivists have to work with individuals and rules and laws and regulations from other countries. Uh, in North America, we had this um, 
I don't know why, well I do know why, but I don't want to go into the history, but actually we have this uh, responsibility for historic records when we're talking about an archivist and then we say that records managers take care of all active records. And uh, I truly would like to see all students that are interested in archives also understand records because if you don't, you're not going to be able to help identify them right at the beginning when they're created in order to enable them to be maintained in a way that you actually have them in some kind of a viable uh, format for when you have to uh, find out how you're going to preserve them. And this is uh, more challenging uh, because we have more digital records, of course. So uh, in North America, we have this schism between archives and records, and uh, actually we're seeing, I think, more of a melding of the two because of the digital technology. Uh, also, you'll see a little note there in the U.S. we have that tradition uh, where archivists are responsible for private or personal archives, but they're called manuscript curators, and I saw some of you are taking a course that is what archives and manuscripts, so you're going to learn a little bit about that. But the European tradition, archivists really had responsibility also for active or semi-active records, so there the, that came together. Uh, and of course it depends on the institution and uh, the way that uh, they are able to manage those records, the resources that they have available and uh, the governing laws at the time. But uh, you're going to see more Europeans talk about archivists and when they talk about archivists they are also referring to records managers. So what is archival science? Archival science is um, a pure and an applied science, and this too is something that uh, I think is quite interesting because there are many people who are pure uh, academics who say we really need to look at the theory of archives and we have to write about, you know, all of these theoretical constructs. And then we have others who are working who say, okay, but what does that mean for me every day? I've got to figure out how to apply then what you're telling me in the real world and you know uh, what you learn in your classroom, I shouldn't say this is as an instructor, but what you learn in the classroom is not always applied exactly the same way when you're at work. You're going to have to find a way to make it work wherever you happen to be. So we have two different views of um, uh, archives, the very theoretical and then also the very practical. Uh, Theo uh, Thomason is another person uh, who has um, written a, uh, an entry in that Encyclopedia of Archival Science and uh, this one is on uh, archival science itself. Uh, Theo is a professor but he's at the University of Amsterdam so we're hearing a little bit about an international view of this as well and uh, Theo uh, says that archival science uh, is a scholarly discipline deals with records and archives as traces of memory. So there you see that international archives we're talking about, but we're also talking about records. And we're talking about them as information objects, some type of evidence of something that has occurred. Uh, it will be historical evidence, of course, if, if we're looking at something in the future and we're trying to learn about what happened in the past. So these are also symbols of past events and cultural heritage uh, objects. And uh, there are a lot of um, individuals who are in the humanities who are interested in uh, cultural heritage uh, who uh, are getting into the archival field and sometimes when I go to uh, presentations in other countries they'll be calling themselves archivists but they're not really trained archivists which is really quite interesting and sometimes annoying. Uh, but uh, I think uh, everyone wants to get onto the archival bandwagon right now. So Namasini, uh, I put her there because she's the titan goddess of memory and remembrance and that really is an important thing. So we've got evidence, yes, but it also is a way for us to remember cultural events that uh, are important to us for our collective memory. So does anybody recognize this Namasini? Do I have anybody who's ever been in our Vicara? We, uh, you do, Crystal. Okay, all right. And Lisette, we uh, we named our estate manager in Second Life for Vicara, Namasini, because she takes care of our virtual uh, archives and records center there. Um, 
archival science, though, as an applied science, very practical. And this is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, does anybody know where that is? Well, read the uh, caption and I guess you'll see. Has anybody visited the Coke safe? Do you know what's in there? It's the recipe, the original recipe for Coke. Uh, that's down in Atlanta. And I was stuck in a snowstorm uh, one uh, weekend in January trying to get, I think, to an Elise conference. And um, happened to be stuck right in Atlanta and decided to go over to the Coke Museum. And uh, they do have this uh, wonderful uh, vault uh, where they keep that Coke recipe, so the original. So you can see that it's a very practical uh, object that they have stored there. Uh, it was in current use for creating uh, the products, the Coke products, so it's, it's business related. Uh, but at the same time, it has this historical uh, aspect to it. Uh, and now it is in uh, their museum there. So archival science is applied. There is a scientific basis for it. But it's also related to records management, right? And some type of archival administration, how are you going to run these facilities that actually uh, are going to um, enable you to manage and to preserve and to uh, share with the public, in some cases, uh, the archival objects. So um, archival science can provide this theoretical but also a methodological framework for designing and managing and using uh, all of the information processes that we need. And we're calling them record keeping systems. And that includes preservation systems. Uh, quite often I hear people talk about preservation and not want to talk about records at all. And really that doesn't make any sense. What are you preserving? So uh, I think the big picture for all of you who are studying here in uh, SJSU in our iSchool, uh, the more broad you can become, the more you can look at record keeping uh, or information management, if you want to call that, but it's more than managing information. Uh, look at your archival aspect, your record management aspect, the preservation aspect, this all comes together. And if you're ever applying for a job, you want to be as flexible as possible, which means you want to understand the big picture, even if you only have one favorite piece, like I want to take care of film, right? You still have to know the big picture in order to make yourself more marketable. So in this case, uh, we see a corporate uh, record uh, that is being preserved. So there are some essential principles that support the archival uh, perspective. And we're getting back to theoretical aspects here. The evidence, uh, there's the sanctity of that evidence. It can't be disturbed. It can't be altered. And so we have to find a way to protect it. Uh, we also have the respect to fonts. And you see that it, it's the same thing as saying provenance or original order or how were these created in the first place and let's keep them in that same manner. We also have the life cycle of records where some of you in my 284 class in the fall, Mara, uh, or are you in info 284 with me this term? Yeah. And we looked at the life cycle of records, both the active and then the uh, inactive so that we can see how they're created and managed and then eventually preserved. Uh, and then there's an organic nature of records. And what that means is, is they're created, but they're always created in relationship to some kind of a, an action. And so they are, again, providing evidence of that action. They're organic. They occur because of other things that are going on. And and then, of course, we have a hierarchy in records and dis uh, descriptions. And a, a lot of times we take a look at, well, then what are the records I'm thinking now as a government? I don't know if any of you have heard one of our presenters, Arian, um, on uh, federal records in the fall. But uh, they're looking at this capstone approach to email management. And uh, that is the National Archives. They are responsible for that. And uh, they do have to capture the president's records. Well, what they're looking at is, so maybe the hierarchy is the people who are in the top rungs of the government, we really have to capture everything. And maybe people who are in charge of departments, we have to capture these things. And maybe lower down in that hierarchy, there are only certain kind of projects they work done that we have to capture or whatever. So they're, they're thinking hierarchically here. 
So Theo goes on to say uh, that in the academic discourse of the last decades, the classic uh, concepts, the theories, the methods have been called into question. And I think this is really important to understand because uh, some of you will be introduced to the theoretical masters, you know, who are the theorists that we should understand. Uh, and that's fine. You memorize what they do to understand what their writings are, but also understand that new New people are coming along and they're also writing uh, about the way they believe uh, records should be uh, created or managed or preserved today based on our laws, our regulations, our environment, our technology. So it's not a static science. Uh, it's not something you can go back to and say, well, this is the way it was in 1800 and so it has to be the way it is now. No, that's not true. Um, and so the discipline is going through a paradigm shift. It's going from custodial to post-custodial um, paradigm. Um, there I'm thinking of like, who's in charge. Uh, you have arguments sometimes uh, the archivist will uh, take a look at uh, or appraise, right, what comes into the archive. They're, they're going to decide uh, what they will keep. They'll decide how they're going to do that, when they're going to make them available to the public. Um, but that's not really the way things happen uh, most often in the digital world. Uh, there are some cases where you have records that are being generated within systems and they don't make sense unless they are retained in those systems, like our GIS systems. There are a lot of digital systems that are uh, have records that have to be maintained in accounting systems and they're going to be there for a very long time because they're active and we're using them. But at the same time, you've got archivists who are saying, but we're going to have to get them eventually and we better be in on this. We better understand that we might be able to provide guidance, uh, but maybe we're not going to have them right within our own uh, organization or our own archive. Uh, maybe they're not all going to be packaged up and shipped to us for us to be able to maintain. Maybe we're going to have to take custody, but they're going to be somewhere else. So it's, it's kind of exciting, I think. I, I like to see the changes that are occurring because of the technology that we're working with now. Think of all the social media records out there. Um, also, postmodern thinkers are, are, are moving away from the paradigm of archival toward the context of record keeping practices and principles. So it, it doesn't mean that we're not saying archival science isn't important. It is very important. And in fact, we did a study, a uh, MARA job survey in the fall, uh, and uh, most of the positions I'm going to share with you in a little bit had the term archivist in the title. So it's, it's very important. It's just that we're not thinking so much about, okay, original order, or okay, we're going to have to do it this way. We're now thinking we've got a lot of records and we have to uh, abide by um, the the um, principles and the practices that are necessary to manage them and to make them available to people now uh, because a lot of times we're working with them uh, and so uh, we will need to use them. We can't just package them up and put them somewhere in an archive. We're going to have to, especially with um, knowledge management, with uh, data mining, uh, we're going to have to be able to use that information, that data, all of that knowledge that resides within those records records even if we're not, uh, if it's not necessary to maintain them for some type of a, a regulation. So we've got two different things going on there. Maybe the archivist isn't always going to capture them and put them away and, and be the only one responsible for them, but also maybe we've got to think a little bit more about how we can use the records uh, in an active manner uh, in order to glean the knowledge that they contain. So I just wanted to show you here that I'm not saying uh, records are, are not important nor that they're not historic. <laughs> this here is a uh, cave drawing and uh, is Watson an archivist Watson? Do you mean uh, IBM Watson, uh, which is a computer? I would not say so. Uh, if you mean Sherlock Holmes, Watson, 
<laughs> IBM Watson. Yeah, no, it's the computer. Uh, and he's not. Uh, it, it, uh, my husband is an IBMer and he loves Watson and uh, Watson is a processor. Watson is able to uh, manage uh, huge amounts of data very quickly, right, and come up with answers. But the, the data is not there for preservation or anything like an archivist would be. That data is there to be used right now. <laughs> I'd like to know who uh, thinks in what sense Watson might be an archivist because I don't. So if anybody would like to let me know, uh, go ahead. Or we'll leave that for later for a conversation. So uh, this here is something that we might take a look at and that a lot of archivists like to uh, consider is the older drawings, the older writings, the older uh, types of records that were maintained that could be clay tablets, that could be tokens, tokens that had little drawings on it like this that actually represented money or represented animals that were being traded. So we've got, I talk a lot about digital, but we've got all kinds of records that still have to be maintained and they're very valuable. Uh, in addition, we're going from that older, those cave drawings, which are considered uh, objects, evidence of the way people had uh, uh, lived before to uh, what we have now, uh, which is another way to share that information. So this is an example of the Swedish National Archives. And if you take a look here, uh, this is all about their historic maps. So if you want to take a look at uh, the way things were in Sweden at a certain time. Uh, they have a terrific collection of uh, maps that you can look at. So uh, I think archivists in the past had uh, maintained collections and people went to the archives, like the National Archives, in order to enjoy them, right? The Declaration of Independence, you really have to see that. It's, it's amazing. Um, but also, archivists are understanding that we have to share with people beyond the walls. And then we do that through uh, this digital realm that we're in. Uh, the Swedish archive that I just showed you is called an archive. But in Sweden, uh, notice that they also say, they have government, uh, government offices of archives and records, and they have record centers. The record centers are still for the uh, active records, and in some cases for records that are kept longer than that. Uh, but then they may be moved to the archives later on. So uh, in uh, Sweden, just as in the United States, uh, we have to figure out how to maintain both the active and then the inactive records, and I think we have to keep that connection between archives and records. Let's let's keep thinking about both of those. Okay, so I think this is more what you might be interested in than what kinds are, uh, of jobs are available for archivists. Well, we did this survey, uh, one of our students, Anna, uh, did just two months of looking at job positions that are available. And uh, she was only looking for those that students who graduated from MARA uh, would be eligible for. So uh, this could even be more in your favor if you're in the MLIS because uh, we only looked at MLIS or uh, equivalent, all right? We didn't look at anything that said you have to be an MLIS graduate or uh, we're not going to hire you because that would not benefit the MARA students. So uh, I'm thinking that a job survey for MLIS students would reveal even more opportunities for uh, archivists. So uh, what we did find is that 82% of the jobs, of the 287 different job postings that we found, uh, had the term archives or archivists in them. Uh, and then just 16% had records. And then 2% have information governance or information management. If uh, you're interested in active um, records, you're, if you're interested in uh, data mining, if you're interested in uh, information management, then information governance is growing field. Uh, that also is a big, broad area that includes legal and risk and information technology and business units and uh, 
all of the aspects of creating a record, maintaining a record, protecting the record, applying security to that record, understanding uh, the legal implications of uh, either retaining the records or disposing of them. So information governance is uh, a really important uh, aspect and it's going to grow. Uh, we're looking uh, toward that to see that increase in the future. Okay, so job titles, this is where it's interesting because uh, there are 118 unique job titles for uh, archivists and so you really have to be open to looking at jobs and their descriptions. What are the tasks? What are the, uh, what is the uh, preparation that they want uh, for you to be able to apply for that job? Because the title alone doesn't always tell you everything you need. Uh, you'll see under these 118 different uh, job titles, uh, there's things like archivist, but you could be an archives technician, you could be an assistant archivist, archivist a digital asset coordinator, which had archives in the description of the job, project archivist, so uh, so many different ways to describe individuals who uh, hold jobs or positions for which you will be trained, uh, you'll be competitive for these. Uh, records management had fewer, 27 unique job titles, but uh, we have the same problem with the records management. Uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, records analyst, for example, records and information specialist, and one of the things that uh, I'm really excited about for the records management piece is that the federal government last spring approved a job series for records management. In the past, they had looked at records management as a subset of office administration. And it has taken years of uh, lobbying at <laughs> the National Archives to push for this, but finally last um, spring uh, they were able to get a job series through for records management. And so in addition to the National Archives, which has units all around the United States, in addition to hiring archivists and hiring librarians, they have positions also called librarians, uh, they will have more positions open for records manager, so it's, it's very exciting. Uh, and then, of course, information management governance, six uh, unique uh, job titles like governance uh, or information manager. So, uh, but uh, again, I see this as a growing uh, field. So where would you get your jobs? Uh, academic institutions are uh, the largest, uh, at least as far as those two months of job postings that we analyzed. 38% of that 218, whatever it was, uh, are in the academic field. Now again, remember though, these are the ones that say MLIS or uh, equivalent or else they'll say uh, records management or they'll say something related to information management. Uh, these are not the ones that say ALA accredited only and you will see some of those as well. And so the MLIS students who want want to work in uh, libraries or in academic settings can broaden their uh, uh, choices uh, if you have the MLIS because it is ALA accredited. Now, uh, that doesn't mean though that government and corporate uh, are going to uh, look on MARA uh, as not being suitable. MARA students don't have the librarianship, so they can't do the ALA accredited because ALA is the American Library Association, right? So Library Association is accrediting you if you take library courses. Uh, in the MLIS you do uh, take a foundation that ALA looks at. Uh, in MARA we have the basis not in library but in records. So we have records and then archives where the um, uh, MLES has a librarianship uh, plus the uh, archives and, and records. And of course, in uh, both, you have other options for electives that you can uh, take, such as preservation and digital curation and uh, uh, the data mining and the cybersecurity is, is a, a big one now too. 
So the organization types, though, we have a lot of academic, the next is government, the next is corporate, and then you'll see that some of you I'm seeing uh, more interested in museums coming into our programs, into both the MLAS and the MAR. Uh, and that, I think, is also a result of the uh, the digital technology that we use uh, for exhibits, for example. So uh, we're seeing uh, more of a uh, convergence, too, of individuals who are interested in cultural institutions and, and museums. So uh, that's another exciting aspect. <laughs> Your MARA internship is in a museum, yes, yeah. And you know, when people ask me what, what should I do so that I can guarantee I'll have a job when I graduate, I just tell them to take a look at your interests and your aptitudes and your ability. Uh, where have you worked in the past? Uh, what kind of courses have you taken before? You just inventory yourself, right? Really understand yourself. And then once you do, take a look at everything we have to offer and what do you need to take now to complement what you already know because everybody in our program has a, a wonderful foundation in something and so what you want to do is add to that and hopefully select broad enough area that will help you get into a position that you'll really enjoy. Uh, don't, don't be too narrow to focused. Uh, think about uh, whatever uh, else you might be able to do. Uh, as uh, I guess I, I'm thinking information management, but I'm also thinking that record keeping aspect, the big umbrella. Keep that uh, in mind. Uh, also in this one you see public library 2%. Uh, they weren't asking for an ALA accreditation. We're seeing more uh, job uh, announcements say uh, or equivalent, but I'm also seeing a lot of job announcements say uh, Oh, um, oh, things like um, uh, history background, political science background, public policy background, social science background. So, it, so when I was talking about really understanding yourself and then what you need to take in order to complement what you already have, uh, I think what's more important than what your degree might say, even though that will get you in the door, uh, is that you also have to have the skills. You have to have the understanding of what is being asked for, and you have to be able to sell yourself. So we talk a lot about, uh, you know, uh, learning to promote yourself uh, and learning to um, understand how you might contribute to any organization. Uh, and in this case, I think we're going to see more opening here, too, uh, of uh, what kind of background you have. So some students will ask about certificates. I don't know, is anybody in a certificate program here today? They'll ask about the value of certificate programs. Uh, those are also valuable. Uh, and the reason they're valuable, of course, is because people who are taking a certificate program already have uh, this foundation. And what they are seeing is that if they can just do these few more courses, they're going to have the knowledge that they need for what their goals are. So uh, you really have to understand your own needs. Now, experience requirements. This is where, though, you can uh, uh, learn a little bit about the types of jobs that are available. Uh, a lot of them don't say that you need uh, experience, but remember, you're going to be competing with somebody else, right, with many other people. So um, it, it may come down to they will take somebody with experience even though they're not asking for it. But there are jobs for people who have only one year of experience or two years. Uh, and down on this end, we see none required or we see demonstrated experience, whatever that might mean, right, or significant experience. So uh, those are very subjective. Um, your internships are really important. Uh, if uh, you can get experience that way, that's terrific. And I'm seeing more of you also volunteering. And uh, volunteer uh, experience is also very valuable. So you want to be sure that you uh, uh, look for ways to get that experience uh, besides after you graduate. How many of you actually work in a uh, archives-related position right now? Any of you? Yes, I see one. Anybody else? Some? Yeah, I do. Okay, there you go. So see, uh, some are volunteering, some work for a, a non-profit, uh, some are interning. So you're seeing, <laughs> I wish. 
<laughs> keep looking. <laughs> you may uh, you may find <laughs> you may find that there are opportunities for you. And oh, some libraries have local history section more like an archives. Absolutely, special collections. Perfect. Yes. Uh huh. Would public libraries, genealogy rooms, and state rooms count as archives? Yeah, I would think so. And I see uh, now I'm looking at our new MARA students, and there are a number of them interested in genealogy, or sometimes genealogy that interests personal uh, gets them to think more broadly, and they decide they want to get into the archival field and do a little more research and a little more exploring. You know what I've also seen is um, the connection with uh, archaeologists for example. Um, there are uh, records of uh, runes. There are people that are still looking for uh, Mayan, uh, um, uh, I guess, um, oh, I want to say buildings, but they're not being really buildings, but ruins still that have not been unearthed. And uh, so in many cases, I, I'm seeing people go to archives con uh, conferences, but they have uh, some type of a, a background that is in archaeology or is in more of ancient history. And uh, I've also um, seen other people that are interested in uh, archives and records, but to establish atrocities during war uh, in um, Oh, Eastern Europe, for example. Uh, so there are just so so many applications to what you're going to learn. It's um, amazing how the foundation that you're going to have will be able to be used in different environments and also working with different types of teams. Uh, when I talk about data curation, uh, data science uh, is also a, a big field and there are people that need to be able to keep records of, of experiments and uh, there are people who need to help them do that. So um, you've just got uh, I think if you get a, a firm foundation, you've just got so much that you can take with you to look for all kinds of positions and not limited to uh, the United States either. I saw a few posts today, first day of class, talking about going to uh, uh, other countries and uh, what a uh, wonderful way to start out a career uh, if you can do that um, by uh, doing it internationally and getting some international experience too. Uh, so software, what are they asking for software? Well, uh, Microsoft Office, uh, we only have listed the number. Remember, there were like 218 positions, and so these are only the numbers that are specifying exact software, not too many. Uh, Microsoft Office 27, uh, last year it was a huge number, and uh, SharePoint is not broken out this time, but now we're seeing the Microsoft Office environment um, actually bring all of their products together. So you've got uh, all of your Word and Excel and your Access and even Yammer for instant messaging and, and SharePoint. So we're using that for class this spring. We used it in the fall, um, SharePoint Online. So uh, I, I'm thinking MS Office can be any of those products. And then uh, Adobe Suite, any of you use that? Uh, Microsoft Adobe Suite, if you're into your graphics, so Photoshop, uh, Dreamweaver, if you're doing any web design. Uh, and there's just, yeah, there's so many applications too for um, the a teensy bit. It's fun. <laughs> Play with it. Yeah, if you have access to any kind of software at all, uh, uh, take advantage of that and uh, learn to use it because you'll find that uh, as you go to other types of software, they have commonalities and you're going to be able to figure out uh, new software based on what you knew was possible in the old software. All you have to do is figure out how to do it, but it's, it's uh, much easier uh, the more practice you get. Uh, this content collection may management software. Um, there are different uh, collection management software you can purchase, but we're using for our new class Preservica, those of you who are in it, 
And um, I was talking to them this week, and they are embedding a collection management uh, functionality within their trusted digital repository. Uh, so that's something that uh, keeps changing. Vendors keep upgrading uh, their uh, offerings, and that's a, a web um, offering that we're using. But uh, collection management is, is extremely important. Oh, one of your props uh, has a uh, oh, suite for uh, for free, huh? I'm afraid to click it now, so I won't do that. But <laughs> I'll, I'll grab the chat later on. Uh, database programs always important. Uh, archivist toolkit, uh, content DM. Uh, I know Alice Scott. Any of you ever take a course with her? She uses content DM in that digital asset management. We have uh, uh, courses in that. So you've got so many options if you take a look at all of the elective courses available that you really just have to think about uh, what kind of focus you might want for some of those electives. I did want to say too when you're selecting them before I forget, the MARS students, because uh, the course is so um, structured, uh, don't have a problem when they're applying to um, positions that require uh, SAA guidelines to be met uh, for master's degree uh, because you need 18 units of archival courses and uh, some of the employers I've talked to say, well, it's a MAR degree, yes, okay, you're fine, I know it, uh, because they have more than that. MLIS, you have electives and uh, titles don't always explain what, what's the content of the course, but you do need 18 uh, at least units of credit in uh, archival related courses, which includes records management, uh, if you're applying for certain archival positions, especially within like state government. And so um, you want to be sure if you really want to uh, have an archival position later on uh, that you take uh, courses that will allow you to earn uh, 18 units of credit. Don't, don't be short. <laughs> One course, all right? Make sure that you select enough so that you've got your uh, 18 there. So what are the technical schools, skills uh, that are necessary? Well, right on top, uh, you've got um, your metadata that's being asked for, a different type of uh, metadata schema. Uh, and uh, Dublin Core, of course, is the basis for a lot of what's going on. And then you have EAD. You've got a course in that being taught here. Uh, so you've got uh, RAD for uh, uh, Canada, you've got a number uh, that are specifically asked for. Uh, and then metadata standards. It is always important to understand standards and their role uh, within any position that you take. So there are, are standards that are, are more relevant to uh, um, information management systems or to records management systems or to archival systems, but uh, uh, understand the metadata standards and what the purpose of this for the metadata uh, in a given circumstance. For example, when we talk about preservation, we're going to be looking at a certain type of metadata. But uh, in one of the courses I teach, we just keep it pretty simple with the Dublin Core because that's a great way to start. And in business, a lot of companies will take that and then they will work from that, add to that. Uh, you also see, though, AV editing software, scripting languages, producing uh, website content. So these are the technical skills that were uh, mentioned. Uh, there are probably others, but they were not specifically mentioned. And then uh, these skills, uh, your oral and written communication skills, uh, you know, I don't know a course that covers Dublin Core, and it was interesting because in the course I taught uh, for enterprise content management and then digital preservation, we had to create um, a um, uh, an XML document for Dublin Core. I had the students do that, and I assumed they would know it, uh, which they did not. So what we did was have a template that we worked from. So certainly didn't, uh, and that was an advanced course, right? Uh, does cataloging? I don't know that they do. I'm sure others do, but I don't think we specifically have one course that says Dublin Core. Uh, it, there wouldn't be enough to do that anyway. I mean, it's not challenging enough to require a course. So let me read this. So we're saying metadata and intro to catalog and classification both have uh, Dublin Core mention. Okay, terrific. 
yeah, for one week. But you know, uh, you get an introduction and then you work with it, uh, and it's it's something that you can pick up. Uh, Library two fifteen uh, nine significantly. Okay, excellent, Amanda. All right. Okay, and then uh, the regular skills, we talked about the oral and written communication, and then you have a writing class, what, your 200 class, I think. Uh, and then interpersonal skills, which is why it's important you're in a, an association like this one. Uh, time management always, organizational skills, and leadership skills. And somebody in one of my classes today said over the break they took uh, ARMA's leadership certificate. It was a, um, an online course, I think, and then at the end of it, uh, they were were able to take a test and get a certificate. And so that's something that didn't take a lot of time uh, and it uh, can be used on a resume. So uh, some examples. I'm going to uh, go through these. I, I know I'm taking a lot of your time, so I'm just going to uh, show you a few of the examples of the job descriptions that we looked at. One was called a CAP archivist, and that just means it was the College of American Pathologists. They did want a CAA certification but it was only preferred, not required. And students can uh, take the CA, the Certified Archivist Exam. Uh, it's given in um, August in conjunction with the SAA conference, uh, but there are other locations you could take it at. And uh, you can be provisionally certified until you meet the experience requirements. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. And notice how they say MLAS or related uh, degree. And uh, also take a look at the responsibilities. And this is one that says you must know your Dublin Core and Mark. And uh, they really want these general skills as well. And look at what you're going to do. I wanted to point this out because they say developing, managing, and archives, but then you get into your records management program and policies and procedures for electronic records and retention and disposition. So there's a convergence. Uh, university archivist at Santa Cruz, two years experience, again, MLIS or related. And uh, over on this side, you've got to have experience in managing projects. So you have project management courses if you think you need that. Uh, and then uh, also taking a look at preservation of foreign digital materials, more and more of the foreign digital. Uh, and then your responsibilities. Uh, <laughs> really are very general, aren't they? Managing administration of university records, promoting the youth, uh, and uh, uh, identify preservation issues, so pretty big. Uh, do we come out of tomorrow with the uh, ability to pass the certifying exam without study? I hope so, uh, because the MAR program was developed based on the ARMA core competencies, the CRM exam uh, information, the um, guidelines by SAA for archives and the uh, ACA uh, Academy of Certified Archivists, their exam for the Certified Archivist exam. So all of that was built in the courses that you take. So this one here, Digital Archivist, State Historical Society of Missouri, and no experience. So this is kind of a nice one, right? But you have to have all of these wonderful skills in managing digitization projects. So when they say digitization, what they mean not born digital, that's the opposite. So uh, taking uh, usually hard copy, right, and then uh, digitizing. Uh, on this side, but we're getting into some website development and uh, also managing, again, those electronic records. Uh, I like how they say continue education. <laughs> We're always going to do that. This one here is a special collections archivist. Somebody mentioned what about special collections in libraries. So here's a good example. Uh, and this one, you're ensuring preservation and access uh, and coordinating that access. Also, a lot of them say provide training, as this one does, uh, be able to train people to utilize uh, the resources that you make available. Uh, and so here's our project management popping up again. Uh, and then on the right hand side, uh, a lot of um, personal uh, attributes that would be invaluable for someone in uh, this position. 
this one is the digital archives, and uh, I wanted to put that in there because I like Walt Disney, and it's at Walt Disney Pictures, and they are looking for three years of experience. But after you get that, uh, you may be able to apply for this. And uh, workflow standards. This is important because the more you work with your digital objects, the more you're going to see the systems require you to set up workflows so that automatically things can happen. And in that course that I was talking about that we taught in the fall, within SharePoint, that's what you do is you set workflow uh, so that uh, certain things can happen, like um, setting a length of time to retain a document. And then when you reach that time, three months, two years, whatever it may be, automatically either sending a notice uh, that it should be uh, discarded or else discarding it, uh, disposing of it. So uh, that's just an idea for workflow. But also, look, metadata comes up here again. Uh, this one, uh, they deal with original artwork and also big search and retrieval, and you get that DMLIS. Uh, your courses, your foundation courses are really good for that. Uh, your, uh, what, 202 uh, course. Then on the right-hand side, Dublin Core, Mets, EAD, Premise, uh, Premise is the one for preservation, uh, HTML uh, for your website development. Even though there are a lot of tools you could use, it doesn't hurt to be able to get into that code to fix things. And then, so how do I prepare? So this is what I mentioned earlier on. So the MARA degree, you've got 11 required MARA courses, and then you can get three uh, related MLIS electives. <laughs> it's not Mickey Mouse, no. And then uh, on the um, MLIS side, uh, you have those required info courses. So when I had mentioned ALA in library, I don't mean that uh, you are prepared only for a library in the archives. That's not true. Uh, the, there were changes in your basic courses, your, your foundation courses, that are very much uh, um, designed to enable you to acquire information management skills. So it, it's been changed quite a bit in the last few years. So you have the, and that's why the designator was changed from the library to info. You have this really terrific foundation in information uh, management retrieval. Uh, and then after that, though, look at your electives. And you have career pathways. Uh, you're all aware you have career pathways that are shown on the website. And the pathways are not required. You don't have to take them the way they're shown. What you can do, though, is look to them for guidance. And two of them that uh, provide good guidance for uh, archives would be the Archives and Preservation one. I think they also have the word cultural heritage in that one. It's a big, long title. Uh, and then the digital curation one. So you'll see the course that are uh, recommended there. They have foundation courses and the recommended courses. Um, so I recommend that one of the MAR courses is an internship or an organizational consulting project, but I also recommend that an info course should be an internship. I think that's invaluable. Uh, and then MLIS students can take up to nine credits for the MAR course offerings, but uh, our MAR students also take up to uh, nine credits from the MLIS offerings. So you can prepare yourselves very well for all those jobs that I showed uh, earlier. And now I'm going to stop and ask if you have any questions. Oh, thanks uh, for putting the Career Pathways website in there. It's a, it's a good place to go to see what's recommended, what's actually available to you. So if you have questions, you could raise your hand or just type in the chat area. I see Pixar has archived internships currently. Oh, what fun, huh? <laughs> What does uh, it mean that a requirement has to be a consulting project? Oh, no, uh, MARA students have an option. Uh, some of you have a lot of experience, and so I know you don't take in the MLISC internship if you uh, have a lot of experience or you're working in the field, you don't need it. But uh, MARA students, when the program was designed, the internship was required. And then we found out that we had students that had a tremendous amount of experience or were working in great jobs. So we put in an organizational consulting project where they could work on a specific project where they are employed uh, and get credit for 
that instead of the internship. And now, just this last year, uh, we realized that uh, in some cases, um, the company that's paying for the student to attend uh, class for the degree, which does happen, uh, would not allow an internship or an organizational project. Uh, they felt that their money had to go to a course. So we actually uh, have opened that up to uh, if you petition me uh, and you're in the MARA, we could take a look at replacing uh, your internship or your organizational project with another course. So you may actually be able to take four MLAS courses. Any other questions? Dr. Franks, I see a, a question from Georgette here. She says, how much cataloging is required or recommended in archival practice with an MLIS degree? Oh, um, I think the one course is really important. Uh, I know that um, it depends on where you're going. There, there were a couple of internships that uh, really wanted you to be able to be productive from day one. Uh, but uh, I would think that just uh, one course in it would be fine. And uh, you don't always see that as the foundation on that career pathway screen. Uh, if you want to take a look at that, just click on the link that's there and uh, take a look at the management and digitization one. Uh, and um, if I'm looking down at the uh, foundation courses, uh, the cataloging is not even one of the basic foundation courses. And that's not because it's not important, but that's because there are other things that are uh, maybe more important, uh, that are more general, that you need to understand records management, you need to understand preservation management, you need to understand, uh, uh, for example, that 256, archives and manuscripts, and then you saw a lot of that electronic records in those job descriptions, so you want to take a course in electronic records like a 284. So uh, there are so many other courses that uh, would help you meet the requests in the job descriptions that uh, if you take uh, cataloging, I think your beginning cataloging classification would be enough. Are there any other questions I missed? Yeah, I see a few questions in the chat box here. Um, there is one from Angie, but Angie, hold on for one second. I'm going to Lizette said, to piggyback on that question, the cataloging question, is cataloging a useful course for an MLIS student interested in digital archives? Well, again, uh, I guess I just want to say that there are so many uh, things that might be more important when you take a look at that job description, so I shouldn't uh, I'm probably not the best person to ask that question of because a lot of the cataloging to me, and I'm probably wrong, so I'm going to ask those of you who have taken cataloging, are more specific to bibliographic control of records such as in a library, right? So um, that is important, but it's not as important as uh, having a metadata course or uh, having a course in preservation management or digital curation or that course that Alice Scott teaches in uh, digital creation tools and technologies with content DM. Remember you saw that required, uh, not required, requested. So um, I guess to me, and yeah, please, if somebody's taken cataloging, raise your hand and talk because I don't want to say it's not important. It's, it's not something I would put as a foundation course you've got to take. I've got other courses I would think you should take first. Uh, digitization course, uh, you know, uh, the electronic records course, the digital uh, uh, curation course, the EAD course, um, just so many others. Anybody want to uh, add uh, why they thought their cataloging course was important? 
and I, I'm not that familiar with it. And please don't drop it because, <laughs> because I'm telling you there are other important that. things. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I actually would not have taken cataloging um, except I took EAD with Lori Lindbergh and she strongly suggested it because, you know, a lot of times when you're working, importing and exporting data, you need to understand uh -huh. the MARC standards and, and, you know, with metadata to kind of give you an overview of some of the other standards. So it, both uh -huh. the metadata class and the cataloging and classification, for my interest, I'm interested in information architecture, but I actually uh -huh. Um, can see where it applies if you're working on that level, you actually have to know all of it because you have to understand that archival context that you're working in, but you also need to be able to, for me, to uh, work with the data at a, at a systems level, at an architecture level, so when you're trying to import and export different formats or if you're trying to write XSLT or XML, um, like I'm, I'm trying to negotiate building that Beethoven Center um, XML database or looking for an internship. So, you know, that's, that's a pretty intense project because they actually want you to set up the whole server and you have to understand all of it, everything. You have to understand the archives, you have to understand the digital stuff. So it really is an exciting opportunity to put all of it together, everything that you're talking about tonight and more. But that's just my particular focus, which is probably, you know, pretty far out there. But um, I found it useful because, because it's really, um, I found Mark really overwhelming. And so to have a whole class focus on breaking it down into very simple pieces was, was I felt very beneficial for me. So, um, but I think I'm taking more of a generalist approach and, and not necessarily being as um, focused on archives, so I think I probably have a little bit more broader approach to to my learning. So anyway, that's that's kind of was my approach to it. Thanks. That's yeah, that's very important. And I know Laurie and I have spoke often about uh, maybe is there a need for a specific introduction to different type of metadata course? I mean, one course that pulls it all together, uh, like you're saying, the Dublin Core. Uh, you know, where does that go? And the EAD has its own course, and where are we getting Mark? I don't know, uh, but that's something. And uh, information architecture. What other courses have you taken with that, or do you think are valuable for that? Uh, I took the vocabulary design, I took XML, I took database management, um, I'm working with an internship for the National Park Service, building them a, a web page for their uh, research library this semester, and I'm, I'm trying to set up an internship next semester for the Beethoven library at SJSU because they need an XML database for that Beethoven archive. Uh -huh. And they, they need full stack development on that, so they need that whole database built from the ground up. So they haven't uh, had anybody show any interest because the, what the, the skill set that they need for their project crosses so many different disciplines. I think it's difficult to find somebody who has the technology understanding, the archival understanding, and the cataloging and classification understanding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's a very unusual project, but, um, you know, I hope, I hope that opportunity works out because I'd really like to work on that internship in the fall. You know, that vocabulary design course that you mentioned is really important if you're going to take cataloging as well, I think, uh, and that's what employers have been telling us. Uh, I like the way you've described all the courses that you've taken because you have something in mind that you enjoy doing, and what you're doing is looking for related electives, so it, it, uh, you're designing your own uh, career pathway there, which is perfect. Uh, and I, I do hope that uh, you have that uh, ability to be able to apply that to a position in the future. And as you say, you're looking for the internship right now, and that's very smart to do that. Any other questions or comments? Because you can certainly help each other. <laughs> Um, Dr. Franks, I wanted to go back to Angie's question here, the, further back in the chat. She says, I am MLIS, 
I know I can take nine MARA courses, but do I need to meet the prerequisites for the MARA classes? No, I'm you don't. Take, or, yeah. Okay. No, and the same thing for our MARA students. They don't have to take their, uh, do the prerequisites for the MLAS. So when you cross over like that, we allow that. We give you permission numbers for that. And then we have no responsibility. <laughs> it, it, actually, it has been working out well, in both ways. Thank you. Uh -huh. Yeah, she lives at the same, yes, yeah, it works. Uh, I think, uh, I don't see any more questions, but I just want to say that uh, the um, students that I've worked with in all of the classes are amazing. So uh, I think we have a terrific program. We have wonderful selection of courses, but more than that, we have um, uh, an amazing group of students that help each other uh, within these classes and that are excited about learning, and I think that helped everybody succeed as well. So uh, I'm sure that regardless of the courses that you decide to take or that pathway uh, that you're going to uh, be able to add to the skills you already have and, and will be very successful. All right, if there's nothing else, thank you very much. I, I enjoyed meeting with you. One more question, Sandy, go ahead. Hey, you're welcome, everyone. Um, everyone, I'm going to go ahead and take the slide over here real quick, unless, Sandy, did you have a question? Um, we just yeah, to I just wanted to know if, if it's possible after graduation that I could continue to take a couple more archives courses? You would have to come back for a certificate. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you could do that post-master's certificate and take five courses. Five courses. Uh -huh. And is, is, there, um, is there a structured program for that, or is that kind of... Uh, uh, there are pathways for that as well. So okay. uh, just, you know, take a look on the website for the postmaster's certificate. Yeah, because I'm not going to be able to take as many archives courses as I wanted um, if I end up getting this internship, but I thought maybe, you know, I could come back and do the certificate later. So, okay, thank you. Definitely. Okay, thank you, everybody.